going to be looking into the word this morning. I know that it is 2020. How many of you have New Year's resolutions? Let me see your hands. <clears throat> Very good. Now, how many of you have New Year's resolutions that you plan to keep? Let me see your hands. <laughs> You know how those New Year's resolutions can be. But today I want to speak to you about one <clears throat> New Year resolution that I think is crucial. And that New Year resolution is really to be a better Christian. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so I'm going to invite you to pray with me as we open the Word of God. And <clears throat> listen to what He has to say to us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, I ask that you would just speak to your people today. Lord, you know that I have uh, issues with my throat right now. Um, and I just pray that you would just uh, help me to speak uh, despite uh, myself. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. <clears throat> Daniel, chapter 1. I want to read to you verse, I actually have my water right here, so thank you. Um, water with oil of oregano. One time I made the mistake of announcing that I was uh, sick from the pulpit. I was preaching someplace else, and I think I had like 10 people come up on the platform to give me stuff. For my, and it was all being recorded. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to drink this water. Remind me to drink my water as I'm up here preaching. Okay, Daniel chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says... In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with, if you can read this part with me, everyone, part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the house, into the treasure house of his God. Let me pause for a moment. <clears throat> and here we have Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible describes Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, as besieging Jerusalem and taking part of the vessels of the house of God, meaning the sanctuary. And where did he take it to? He took it to his house, the house of his God's in Babylon. I want to invite you to turn again with me to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And we're going to look at verses 9 and 10. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verses 9 and 10. It's up on the screen. The Bible says Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign <clears throat> and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 10. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with, read that with me everyone, the goodly what? <clears throat> Vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Now, you're not reading the same story here. You're actually reading that there were two times that Nebuchadnezzar went to Jerusalem so far. Um, and attacked the city and took vessels out of where? Out of the house of God and did what? Brought it to Babylon. Now I want you to notice with me, same chapter, verse 11. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was what? evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. 
<clears throat> and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the, Israel, unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief priests, chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the what? <clears throat> Abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God <clears throat> and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Verse 17. Therefore, he brought on them the king account of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hands. Verse 18. And all the, read that with me everyone, vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon, verse 19, and they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. How many times did Nebuchadnezzar go to Babylon and attack it? How many times? Three times. And each time, what did he do? He took some of the vessels of the house of God and did what? Brought it to Babylon. Brought it to where everyone? Brought it to Babylon. <clears throat> it's significant that it was little by little that the treasures of the house of God, the treasures of the sanctuary, were brought to Babylon and held there in the house of Nebuchadnezzar's God. So why did God allow this? What do you think? Why did God allow the treasures of his house, of the sanctuary, to be taken like this? Help me out. What do you think? To teach them a lesson. Why did they need a lesson? Because they, they were rebelling. Pretty simple answer. The children of Israel were rebelling against God. And as a result, Babylon comes and takes the treasures of the house of God, little by little, into their own country. <clears throat> I want you to notice with me Ezekiel chapter 8. And Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 5 and 6 the Bible tells us exactly why this happens. Ezekiel is in vision. The Bible says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north. And behold, northward of the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Verse 6, He said unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed there, that I should do what? Go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. What was Israel doing? Why did God leave his sanctuary? Because of Because of the abominations that were happening in the temple. And as a result of those abominations, God allows another nation to come and capture the temple. So what were these abominations? I want to invite you again to turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. And I want you to notice this very carefully with me. <clears throat> the Bible says here, These six things 
does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an what? An abomination unto him. What are those seven things that are an abomination unto him? Let's find out. Verse 17. A proud what? A proud look. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever thought that a proud look was an abomination unto God? <laughs> like when we think about things that are an abomination unto God, this morning we were talking in Sabbath school and you know we were mentioning a couple of things that, we, that people thought were abominations unto God. But many people don't realize that one of the things that God specifically calls an abomination is a proud look. <clears throat> what else? A lying what? A lying tongue. A lying tongue to God is an abomination. What else? Hands that shed innocent blood. Let's look at verse 18. A heart that what? Deviseth mis well, wicked, wicked imaginations and feet that be what? Swift and run into mischief. Now pause for a second. I want you to see if you notice a common thread in these two verses that I just read. Do you notice a common thread about the things that are an abomination unto the Lord? I want you to think it. Can we go back to verse 17? And, and I'm going to see if I can help you here without helping you too much. A proud what? Look. A lying what? Tongue. And what? Hands that shed innocent blood. Let's go to the next verse. Uh, a what? Okay, pause for a second. Do any of you see a common thread in these two verses? The body. The body. In other words, eyes, hands, feet, heart. Right? We're talking about a person. <clears throat> Tongue. We're talking... Now, now, how many of you realize that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we don't need to turn there right now, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says, Know ye not that you are what? The temple of God. So if we have any temples in here, give me, just raise your hand. I'm a temple. I'm a temple. I'm a temple. Now, why did God allow the items of the temple to be taken into captivity because of the abominations being done where? In the temple. Because of the abominations being done in the temple, the temple was ultimately taken captive by Babylon. Are you with me so far? So, so now we look at these, what, what is an abomination unto God? And we see, whoa. A heart that devises wickedness, a lying tongue, hands that shed blood, feet that are swift to, uh, to, to mischief. In other words, God is pointing out here that, that the temple, the person that does these things is in actuality committing abominations. Where? In the temple. Let me keep reading. Verse 19. A false witness that... Speaks what? Lies, and he that soweth what? Discord among brethren. These are the things that are an abomination unto God. And as we look back at ancient Israel, and we think, man, wow, they, they, they. How many of you look back at ancient Israel and go, man, those were a stubborn people. They were rebellious. If I were in those days, surely... I would have been able to identify that rebellion and I would have been one that really stood for God. Amen. <laughs> Beloved, all we have to do is look at this list of abominations and realize something very important. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. I want you to notice this. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Know you not that you are what? The temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. And now notice this next verse. If any man do what? If any man what? Defile the temple. Now pause for a second. What is it that defiles the temple? What does God say defiles the temple? He calls it a word. That word is what? Abominations. 
So you mean that if I have a proud look or a lying tongue or hands that are uh, 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 quick or that, that shed blood or feet that are swift to mischief, you mean to tell me that I am actually defiling my temple? Is that true? Yeah. So God says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God what? Destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. But beloved, I want you to catch something here. You see, your temple is not destroyed all at one time. Do you catch what I just said? Remember, Nebuchadnezzar took away parts of the temple. How? Little by little. It was because of the compromises and because of the, the, the constant rebellion against God that little by little, the articles of furniture in the sanctuary end up where? In Babylon. God said in Exodus 25 verse 8, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. Why did he say that? Why, was, why did he say, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them? What is the purpose of the sanctuary? Okay, to worship God. But, but I would suggest that there is, there is an even greater and more urgent purpose to the sanctuary. What, what was a sanctuary given to teach man? The plan of salvation, which involves the cleansing from sins. Amen? The sanctuary was given to teach man how he could dwell with God. But listen carefully. Why could man not dwell with God? <clears throat> because of what? Sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2. Notice what it says. Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your what's? Iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So if sin causes separation from God, then God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, signifying that the sanctuary was the way in which God, the, the method by where God would cause it so that he could dwell with man. Does that make sense? So, so the sanctuary was God's way of connecting with us, removing sin out of the way so that he could connect with us. So can someone tell me what is sin? Sin is transgression of the law. And where do we transgress the law? That's, you, you transgress the law where? In your temples. You transgress the law in your mind. So the sanctuary was designed to lead us away from transgressing the law where? In our minds. Because if you don't do it in your mind, then your hands won't do it either. Do you catch what I just said? You see, your mind is what controls your feet. Your mind is what controls your hands. Your mind is what controls your tongue. So God gave us a sanctuary in essence to teach us how to control your mind. I need you to follow this. Different principles, yes? So I want you to help me out here. Like the altar of sacrifice. What principle do you think that represented? The death of Jesus. Okay, very good. What, how would you describe, what are some things you would use to describe principles that would point to the death of Christ? Humility. Who said that? Who? Okay, you're being humble. Okay, there you go. Humility. Humility. So, so let me ask you, is that a principle that you think God would like his people to exhibit in the mind? Yeah. Listen carefully. Each article of furniture 
represents a principle which God wants us to exhibit in the mind. So the altar of sacrifice, representing humility, Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God is saying, listen, when you look at the sanctuary, I want you to understand the principle of humility and I want you to exercise that. Why? Because humility is something that will keep you away from abominations. Wait, what was the first abomination? Oh, a proud look. So God is saying, if you exercise the principle of the altar of sacrifice, that will keep you from having what? A proud look. And this is what God is trying to do. He's trying to show us that the articles of furniture all represent principles that we ought to be exercising where? In the mind. But there's a problem. Because you see, we have an adversary by the name of Satan who wants to do everything in his power to capture, listen carefully to what I'm about to say, to capture your mind. Yes? How does he do it? Does he do it all at once? No, he doesn't do it all at once, does he? He does it what? Little by little, he does it slowly, he does it over weeks and months and years. And what happens is, he will come and he will capture a part of your mind and bring it where? He'll bring it to Babylon. Wait, I don't know if you understood what I just said just now. He will capture a little of your mind. See, when you keep exercising that proud look, that, that gives Satan access to your mind. And when he has access to your mind, he takes that part and he brings a little piece of you into Babylon to his house. And as you continue to allow Satan to have access to your what, everyone? To your mind, what happens is he takes a little bit of you into Babylon. A little bit of you into Babylon until we get to the place where we begin to think like Babylon. I want you to understand this is what God, this is what Satan's trying to lead you to. He wants you to be captured, but he wants your thinking process to be Babylonian. If I can get you to begin to exercise proud looks, lying tongues, the more I can get you to do this is the more I'm bringing you into captivity, is the more I'm bringing you into my dominion, is the more I'm bringing you under my power. And so as we look at this Old Testament sanctuary and how it was broken down little by little and ultimately taken to Babylon, what we're seeing here is a picture of how Satan is seeking to destroy each and every soul. A proud look. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a what? Before a fall. Beloved, if we allow a proud look to dominate us in the year 2020, guess what? You're not going to have a good Christian year. How many of you would like to have a good Christian year? One of the first things you're going to have to do, one of the first things we all have to do is learn how to conquer that proud look, is learn how to exercise humility over pride. What about the labor? Remember how the labor pointed to the, the washing away of sins? Why does God wash away our sins the way he does? What, is, what, what do we call that when God washes away our sins? He cleanses us, meaning he is doing something. Why do we need the washing away of sins? How do we get the washing away of sins? What do we ask for? We're asking to be forgiven. Forgiven. How many of you are glad that God forgives us? And, and then doesn't he say that because he has forgiven us, he requires that we 
forgive others? Yeah? But what is the reason that we typically don't forgive others? <laughs> Pride is one. How about bitterness? You know what Hebrews 12 says about bitterness? Let me read it. Let's get it up on the screen. Hebrews 12, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God, looking diligently, lest any, uh, lest any root of what? Bitterness spring up and trouble you, and thereby many be what? Defile. If the purpose of the labor is to cleanse, watch this guys, bitterness defiles. And do you realize that as long as you have a bitter root in your heart, you are giving Satan access to work in you and to slowly bring you into Babylon? Who have you not forgiven? Who do you refuse to give, to forgive? Who are you struggling with with bitterness in your heart right now for? Because bitterness is a door through which the king of Babylon, Satan, can have access to your temple. What about this one? The table of showbread. The table of showbread points us to the word of God. What is one of the easiest ways Satan can have access to you because of the word of God? Someone said disobedience. How about unbelief? How about unbelief? If God calls us to believe in his word, can we exercise a spirit of unbelief that will give Satan access to the temple? Notice again with me. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. The Bible says, take heed brethren, lest there be any of you uh, having an evil heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. God says he loves you. How many of you believe that? How many of you struggle to believe that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Can you exercise unbelief in the love of God for you? Do you think Satan is a master of putting doubt in the hearts of people? You're not really important. God really doesn't care about you. You're no one. No one likes you. No one. Do you think Satan messes with people in that way and beloved God is trying to tell us listen don't believe the devil's lie because if you have unbelief in your heart if you don't believe that I truly love you you are giving Satan access to your heart to totally take your mind away to where to Babylon the altar of incense symbolized prayer. Let me ask you, can lack of prayer lead you to be taken captive by Babylon? The, 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 seven, the seven branch candlestick represented light. I'm going to ask you a question. Can dwelling in darkness, can dwelling on, how many of you like, don't raise your hand. When something is presented to you, you always see the dark side. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Can being pessimistic cause Satan to have access to your mind? Can you be pessimistic to the point where no matter what someone does, you know they were up to evil? <laughs> like a person just cannot do good because sometimes we call that like street smarts. I know I can read people. No, you can't read people. <laughs> Right? Only God can ultimately read the heart. Amen? Even the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant pointed to, 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 God's, to, to the law of God, which was summarized by one word, which is love. Let me ask you a question. Can a loveless heart be, can Satan have access to a loveless heart? You see, beloved, listen, these are the things that have either allowed Satan to have access to so many of us that we're practically living in Babylon, even though we're in the church. And God is saying, listen, if you want to, if you want to stop it, there's a way you can make a change. You can actually change the way that you do things. 
You can go into 2020 no longer being bound by, by the lying tongue, being bound by, by feet uh, swift to miss or hands that shed innocent blood. You can, you can change things. You can become a better Christian for 2020. I want you to check this out. Because how many of you remember how Babylon, how um, Israel was ultimately delivered from Babylon? How was Israel delivered from Babylon? Who? Say again. I thought I heard someone say a name. Cyrus. Okay. Cyrus is the leader of the Medo-Persian Empire who God rose up to do what? To deliver Israel. And I want you to notice Isaiah 45, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says here. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. Now pause for a second. What is this talking about? What, was Cy- what are the two leaved gates that Cyrus was going to open? The gates of what kingdom? Babylon. God called Cyrus on the scene and, 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 and said of Cyrus that he would... By the way, Cyrus is called the anointed one. Does that title sound familiar? Does that title sound familiar? Cyrus, beloved, was a type of who? Jesus, and I want you to notice what it was said of Cyrus. He would open the gates of Babylon, but not only would he open the gates of Babylon, notice with me, Isaiah chapter 44, 44 verse 26 or verse 28. Isaiah 44 verse 28. The Bible says that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Okay, two things Cyrus was supposed to do. He was going to open the gates of Babylon to set the captives free and he was going to tell the captives to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild what? The temple. Do you see a type of the work of Jesus here? Watch this, guys. Because of our own sins, because of our own abominations being exercised in the temple, we were taken captive. Some of us are taken captive in Babylonian thinking right now. I don't like you. I have an issue with this. I, have, I, am, I, am, I, am, uh, I don't believe that God really loves me. Our thinking has become Babylonian. But God does not leave us in captivity. Jesus Christ says, listen, if you allow me to, I will come into you. I will open the gates that currently hold you captive and set you free so that you can go back and begin the work of rebuilding How many of you would like a rebuilt temple in 2020? I want you to think about that. Many of us have had our temples just totally like ransacked by Satan in 2019. We're walking around with bitterness. We're walking around with unbelief. We're walking around with, with anger. We're walking around with all kinds of stuff. The temple has been ransacked. Jesus says, if you let me, I will set you free. So that you can begin the work of reformation. I want you to understand something. When Cyrus set the captives free, who, how many of you remember who it was that led the reformation to rebuild the temple? Who was it? It was not Nehemiah. It was Ezra. It was Ezra. And if you check out the story of Ezra, uh, in in, uh, Ezra chapter 1, you will notice that when Ezra begins his reformation, the first thing that he rebuilds, how many of you know what is the first thing Ezra rebuilds? To begin the reformation of the temple. It was the altar of sacrifice. Beloved, please look.
If you want to begin the work of reformation, it begins, it begins with the spirit of humility. The spirit of what, everyone? Humility. Because without the spirit of humility, nothing else is going to be accomplished. Without the spirit of humility, all else fails. So God is saying, listen, if you want to rebuild the temple, the first thing that must happen is you must let me into your heart. I will open the gates and set you free and you are going to go and you're going to begin the work of rebuilding the temple. And the first thing I want you to focus on is the spirit of humility. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will do what? He will lift you up. Now did Ezra have an easy, easy time rebuilding the temple? Was there opposition when it came to Ezra building the temple? So you can expect that as you're going about seeking to rebuild humility, seeking to exercise forgiveness, seeking to exercise truth instead of unbelief, when you go about doing these things, are you going to run into resistance? Absolutely. But beloved, if you are faithful, God will complete the work in us. Amen? So, Ezra begins the work of building the temple. What is he trying to do here? What does it mean to rebuild a temple? Asking for you and me now, what does it mean for you and I to rebuild our temples? It's very simple, guys. To rebuild a temple means to change your mind. It means to do what, everyone? Change your mind. What do I mean, change your mind? Remember, it's the mind that controls the hands, the feet. It's the mind that controls the tongue. God says, listen, in order for you not to end up in the same place you were, in order for your temple not to be ransacked, you need to learn how to change your mind. And we know that it is God that does it in us and through us. But I want you to listen very carefully because to change your mind means something very literal. It means I have to start thinking daily about the principle of humility. Lord, help me to be humble. I need to exercise daily the principle of forgiveness at the labor. Lord, help me to learn how to forgive. You remember we talked about neuroplasticity a few weeks back? How when you learn how to think something and you think it continually, it begins to form new pathways in your mind and it literally changes your mind? God is trying to tell us, listen, if you think through the articles of furniture in the sanctuary, and if you do this daily, it will change your mind. So now I'm going to begin to ask, Lord, give me opportunities to be humble. Every day I'm going to get up and I want to say, Lord, write humility in my mind. Give me opportunities to forgive, Lord, write forgiveness in my mind. Give me opportunities to believe, Lord, write belief in my mind. Write prayer in my mind. Write letting my light shine in my mind. Write loving your neighbor, loving my neighbor in my mind. Write it in my mind so that I, my mind is literally being changed. You see... It was not enough for Ezra to begin the Reformation. He did not complete the Reformation, did he? It was Nehemiah that came along afterward and completed the Reformation. It's not enough for us to say, Oh, it's a new year and I'm going to change things and not follow it through. The Reformation has to be completed. And so let's talk about Nehemiah just for a few moments before we close up. You see, Nehemiah's work was to do something very specific. How many of you know what that was? It was to build what? Build a wall. Why was a wall necessary? What does a wall do? It protects. Listen carefully, beloved. The wall was built to protect the temple. 
It's not enough to just say, I'm going to change. A reformation must be complete. In other words, you must learn how to guard your mind. Not only must I begin to change my mind, but Lord, help me to guard my mind so that the enemy cannot have access to it any longer. Beloved, I don't know about you. But I hate it when I know that the enemy is messing with my thinking. When he's messing with me about what this person did to you or what happened here or what happened there and, and, and the, the possibilities of bitterness are right there waiting for you to just reach out and grab it. Yep, I'm bitter. Yep, I'm angry. Yep, I'm, I'm doubtful right now. Yep, I don't believe. All those things Satan is trying to, to put into your mind so that he can take you captive. But God says, listen, I came to set the captives free. So beloved, what should your New Year's resolution be? Among all the other resolutions, this is what I believe our New Year's resolution should be. Lord, change my mind. Change my mind. Help me to begin thinking along these principles and not just weekly, not just monthly. Help me to think these principles daily. Because if I think them daily, it's going to have an effect on my mind and my, 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 my temple, my sanctuary will be cleansed. Satan will not have access to take me captive as he does at his will. So it's 2020. And today you're saying, all right, Lord, it's time for a new temple. Because this one has been just trampled upon by the enemy. Teach me how to forgive. Teach me how to love. Teach me how to humble myself. Teach me. And let me tell you, it... The way the Lord teaches, you want to be humble? You want to, how many of you would like to be humble? God will bring you before people who you are like, I, Lord, I refuse to humble myself before that person. And the Lord's like, well, I thought you, <laughs> thought you wanted to learn humility. Lord, teach me to love. How many of you want to love? Love better. Oh, amen. And he'll bring you just that person that you're like, no, but not her, Lord. I wasn't talking about her. <laughs> uh, teach me how to love someone. Yes, I can love him. Teach me how to love him. Teach me how to love that one, but not her. The Lord will bring the very people before your path to teach you the very lessons he needs to, he needs to teach you. You want a cleansed temple? You have to trust the Lord. You have to trust the Lord. So my appeal today, come down to the front if you're ready. You're saying today, Lord, 2020, I need a new heart. I need a new mind. I need a new temple. I'm going to invite you to come down because we're going to have a special prayer. Prayer, Lord, I need a new temple. My temple's been beat up. It's time to start anew. It's time to start anew. The question is, do you surrender all? Will you allow bitterness to dwell in your heart? You know what a lying tongue says? A lying tongue says, I don't have bitterness, bitterness in my heart. No. A lying tongue denies the reality of the condition of your temple. Don't deny the condition of your temple. Begin there. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord.